Recording in progress. Good morning, everybody. Hello, and welcome to our next lecture video series where we're discussing buffers. So up to this point, we have seen our means of calculating pH for a buffer solution. So let's recall that we calculate the pH of a buffer solution via the henderson hasselbalch equation, which said that pH is equal to pKa plus the log of concentration conjugate base over concentration weak acid. This is the henderson hasselbalch equation. So again, pH, this is the pH of the buffer solution. pKa, this is the negative log base 10 of the Ka of the weak acid. A minus concentration is the concentration of conjugate base. Anion, that had to come from the weak acid. And HA is the concentration of weak acid, where in the buffer mixture, we have a proportion of conjugate to the weak acid that is non-negligible, meaning like there's gotta be ideally roughly equivalent amounts so decently large proportion of both the conjugate base and the weak acid in solution and decently large, like one has to be within 10% the concentration range of the other. So like 10% rules, kind of what we call that. So this is the henderson hasselbalch equation and this is how we find pH. And if you notice, in this expression, we're talking about weak acid. Weak acid and the conjugate base from the weak acid. And again, pH, remember, is an expression of concentration of acid in a log term. So all of this is given, like the way that we've seen the henderson hasselbalch equation is given for some weak acid and its conjugate. So this form presumes some weak acid and its conjugate base. Now, if we think about all of the acid-base equilibrium that we've discussed up until this point, you'll realize that we haven't only looked at weak acid dissociations, right? Like we've kind of focused on weak acids in the sense that we've done a lot of titrations where weak acids were the analyte, but we've also looked at weak base dissociations. So let's ask ourselves a question. How might this equation change if we were looking at a buffer solution of a weak base B and its conjugate acid, BH plus? So the henderson hasselbalch equation will have the same structure for a weak base as it does for a weak acid buffer. So we can imagine that we would have, instead of pKa, pKb, where pKb is the dissociation constant of our weak base with the negative log taken of that. Plus the log base 10, 
And let's pay attention to what we see in the format of the henderson hasselbalch equation for a weak acid. We have conjugate over the original weak substance. So in our case, this is going to be the conjugate acid, BH plus, over the original weak base, B. So the form of henderson hasselbalch is always conjugate over the thing that conjugate came from. So BH plus is the concentration of conjugate acid ion from the weak base B. And then concentration B is our concentration of weak base. So we are talking about, again, KB, bases, weak base, the conjugate acid of a weak base. All right. There is one more thing we have to change about the structure of the henderson hasselbalch equation if we're talking about a weak base buffer solution. So looking back at our acidic expression, we were able to say that if we look at the sum of the pKa and the log of the proportion of conjugate base per weak acid, that would give us the pH or measure of acidity of the solution. In this form down here at the bottom, we're looking at the sum of the pKb of some weak base plus the log of conjugate acid per weak base in solution. And that's not going to give us the measure of acidity in the solution. Rather, that's going to give us a measure of the basicity, which we express using pOH. So it's important to know that we can't just assume that by changing like the Ka to Kb or the terms inside the log to basic terms from acidic terms that we're going to get pH. This expression of the henderson hasselbalch equation is looking at some weak base with its conjugate acid. And that tells us the dependence of pOH on those terms, pKb, and the log of the quotient. And just a reminder about why we care about this, a buffer solution is a solution where we have some weak substance and its conjugate, some weak substance and its conjugate present in non-negligible quantities. So like we have ideally equivalents or like 50% of one is the other, right? Something like that. So that's what it means to be a buffer. Okay. So this was a little short video because it was wrapping up our conversation about buffers at large. We talked about buffering capacity or the ability that we can predict for a buffered solution to resist changes to pH. We have calculated using um, the henderson hasselbalch equation information about relative solution concentrations. I could ask you to solve for any term in the henderson hasselbalch equation if we're given a weak acid buffer and or a weak base buffer, given here in blue. And we've also discussed how buffer solutions work they work by allowing there to be some neutralization of R A minus with added acid and HA with hydroxide. So because we effectively have both acid and base in solution, then we can neutralize both base, excuse me, both base and acid that's added, as long as it's added in small quantities that don't exceed the buffering capacity of our buffered.
So why do we care about this? Like, why are we learning about buffer solutions? So you saw the example where we talked about in microbiology um, and in biology in general, the majority of biological systems, including our blood, are things that exist in buffered uh, environments or conditions, meaning like we want to ensure that our blood doesn't become hypoxic or um, hyperoxic. We want to ensure that we have exchanges of different ions across different um, tissues and organs, et cetera, that don't cause drastic changes in like the acidity or basicity of our cells' environments. And so the way that a lot of biological processes have evolved is such that there's these buffering solutions that exist within us. So for example, we are a carbonate carbonic um, acid buffer in our blood. Might remember that from our midterm extra credit question, but there is in terms of like a chemistry perspective, another reason why we care about buffers. And that is because all this time in the lab, when we've been building titration curves by controlling a neutralization between either a strong acid and strong base, or a strong base and weak acid, or a weak base and strong acid, et cetera, there's been a reason why these titration curves are shaped the way they are. And we can explain that by looking at what it means to be a buffer and thinking about what's in our reaction or analyte beaker when we perform those titrations. So coming up next is a deep dive into titration curves and also titration stoichiometry. I think that's a good thing to note here. Because if we understand how to identify critical pieces of information from our titration curves, we will better understand the actual acid-base chemistry that's occurring when we have these kinds of equilibria that are established from our weak acids and bases. So where we're headed next is our wrap-up of acid-base equilibrium-ish, where we're going to talk about titration curves. So see you then.